Okay, hi everyone. So again, some of you might be wondering about your exam results. For Top Hat, it doesn't release the raw scores until everyone's taken their exams. So we're waiting for everyone to finish up their makeup exam. If you haven't taken your makeup exam already, then remember that the course policy is one at least one, you have to take it within one week. So you have two options. You either can book it on your own time at the Manoa Testing Center, or you email me when the, the day you want to make up the makeup exam. So again, it has to be this week. All right, so we didn't have time to cover the heart before exam one. So this is the course map for unit two. We're going to cover the cardiovascular system, the rest of the part. So we talked about the blood already, but now we're going to talk about the heart, then the blood vessels, and then we end up talking about the lungs as well. Now, this is our thing that I think, so our next exam is after the spring break, but I'm writing that book along with the rest of the AMP professors at the, in the UH system. So other, like the week before spring break and the week after, I think I have to double check my calendar. But the Mondays and Friday, or one Mondays and Wednesdays of those weeks, that's when our book workshop is. So I'll have to pre-record those so there won't be live lectures. But I'll announce every time that I have to use a recording instead of a, a live lecture. So I'll let you know in advance. But, so we talked about my favorite system at the very beginning of the semester, but actually this is also one of my favorite systems, the heart. And this is why I spent most of my postdoctoral studies researching the heart. And it's great because like, I mean, my mom, she also said, oh yeah, when I take it, took AMP, the heart was my favorite organ because all it does is pump blood. And she's not incorrect, it, but how it pumps blood and the things that can go wrong and it's carrying out its function, it gets a lot more complicated, so yeah. All right, so where is your heart? And you might be like, okay, so this is your body, and where's your heart in your body? Well, you can feel where your body, your heart is, right? You can feel your heart pounding your chest, right? So, or how about another way? So why do we, when you're putting your hand over your heart for the national anthem, or how about eponomy, or whatever, you put your hand over your heart, how do you usually do that? You usually take your right arm and put your right hand and put it over your chest and point toward the left, right? Now. That is kind of approximately where your heart is. So your heart is central, but notice that it's a little offset to, or like going more toward the left. So this part right here, what we call the apex, it goes more toward the left side of your body. So yeah, so that, so that, like to do it, because you're pointing to the words left, your heart points to the left, but it doesn't point upwards. It actually points downwards. So if you want to be anatomically correct, this is how your heart is pointed. Again, it's in the central, but it's pointing down towards the left. But this looks a little awkward, so that's why we do this when we do the national anthem. But yeah, that's where your heart is. It's in the center, but points down and toward the left. Now, but here with the external anatomy of the heart. So here we have like the different landmarks, and pretty much any of these landmarks, and these are on your homework that's been, that was released early. So that's what we have here over here. And then also here we have like, so this is the the, um, the martini version. I think this is a little more clear and tells you, I think there's a lot of detail in this one with the open stacks, but I think definitely these you should know. The major arteries, the major vessels, and the major landmarks of the heart. So this is looking on the outside of the heart. Now, if you look at the back of the heart, you see that there are even more structures as well. So any of these are fair game for testing on over here. Yes, sir. And then over here is that, like, we have the martini version. So again, the martini version is, it has a little more shininess, and I think it's a little more organized. Again, like, OpenStax is free. It's sometimes, like, the great value version of the martini version, but don't, well, I shouldn't dunk on great value, because, I mean, it's like, okay, everyone shop on Walmart. But I'll explain why, like, like I remember like I was making butter mochi and then I got the great value butter and when I was heating it up, it, it didn't dissolve completely. It actually kind of split into a clear part and then all those solids like that kind of like clumped at the bot top and like this is weird. It doesn't melt like how it usually is. So I never trust great value butter after that point. But to, to the side, I like the martini version because it, I think it does a better job of illustrating these figures of the heart or these structures. Now, 
Kat, do you know how, and this is why I take a different approach because usually like when people teach the heart, they go with the outer surface and they go with the outer anatomy, then they go on the inside. But I think it's like teaching someone about how an engine operates. Do you know how an engine operates just by looking at, at um, just like looking at the outside of the engine? No, you have to know how the injector, fuel injectors, how the cylinders and pistons work. So this is how I teach the heart. I teach it from the inside going toward the outside. So if you look at the inside of the heart, you notice that there's many structures, but there are four main chambers to the heart. Hard to see in this figure, but I'll try to use another figure that helps to, this, to illustrate it better. So what we have here, we have the two atria. So the atria are over here and the ventricles are down here. So these are the four main chambers of the heart. And again, we're talking about the human heart. Not, we're not talking about those fancy other things. It was it octopi that have this like interesting three chamber heart? Yeah, some other organisms have different hearts, but in humans, four main heart chambers. And the way, in this case, look, okay, is it the atria on the top or in the ventricles on the bottom or the ventricles on the top and the atria on the bottom? Here's the easy handy dandy mnemonic. So you go A on top, V on bottom, A and V. So atria on the top and superior. The ventricles are inferior and on the bottom. Now let's do a very easy top hat question. Okay, top hat question and join code similar. And okay, so this is one of those click on target questions. And again, click on target questions won't be asked during, uh, or maybe if I have an extra credit question, but in terms of your regular exam, it doesn't have that. So just click on the square located in the left atrium. If you are here last semester, you know how these, left, these yellow square ones work. Invest in carry gold. I know the Irish butter, like, yeah, it's, I, I don't use great value butter. I always use like a trusted brand because, yeah, when I saw that great value butter split, I'm like, that is, I'm like, that's not how it usually turns out. Only the best for my grandma's butter mochi recipe. All right, let's see what people said. So did people, what did people say the left atrium was? And they said most of you clicked here on um, this chamber over here, a few in this chamber, and a few, uh, maybe one or two down here. So again, those down there are the ventricles. Again, ventricles are on the bottom, atria are on the top. Now left and right. So hopefully you know your left and right, but if you don't, let's review. So your left and right, again, remember when we're talking about anatomy and we're talking about yeah, we're going to talk about anatomy. It's about the patient. It's not about you. So again, throw back all the way to fill 141 is when you learned about left and right. So your this is the left. So again, we're talking about your patient's left. So they say like, well, the left side, if you're going to a doctor or a nurse or and you're like, oh, my, the left side of my chest hurts. Do they want to say, well, this is my left. Therefore, I think this part hurts on you. No, it's about where the patient is describing when what part of the patient is being affected. So that is the left side. So this is the your left side of the body. So that was the left atrium in the upper, even though in the picture, it looks like the right of that frame and view, that is the left of the patient. Now the right is over here. So this is why that was the left atrium all the way up here. So again, most of you got right, great job. If not, now you know to be very careful about your left and right. Now left and right here are in this view of the heart. So we're looking at the anterior. So if you're facing someone and looking at them, their left is going to be on your right. So again, this is looking at someone, pretending you're looking through their chest and you're just seeing this cross section of their heart. So left is here, right is here. Now this is the left atrium. That's what our question was. And then you have the left ventricle. So again, atrium to ventricle and then right atrium on the other side and right ventricle down here. So these are the four main chambers of the heart, atria and ventricles, left and right. Now, what we have here is that there's common misconception. So you look at this picture over here and you see reds and blues. Now, a common myth is that blue is a vein. So most of the vessels that are colored blue, they are veins, but there is a very important exception. So let's talk about how blood flows through the heart. And this is why I teach the, again, the main purpose of the heart is to circulate blood. That's why I teach it from the inside out. 
Now, blue is actually deoxygenated blood, meaning that this is blood that is poor in oxygen. Most of the oxygen has been stripped from the blood and the hemoglobin. So what we have here is that as blood travels through your body, your different cells and tissues absorb the oxygen and consume the oxygen. So as blood travels through your body, it loses more and more oxygen. Thereby, therefore, by the time it reaches your heart again, it's depleted of oxygen. So this blue deoxygenated blood, or I should say like deoxygenated blood that's color-coded blue is going to return from your upper body, so things like your head and neck, and then it's going to go also return from your lower body. So it returns via these big blood vessels called vena cavae, or vena cava for singular. So there's a superior one that collects deoxygenated blood from your superior parts of your body, the upper parts above your heart. And then you have the inferior vena cava collecting deoxygenated blood from your lower body. So these great vessels are going to collect in the right atrium. So the right atrium is the first point where this deoxygenated blood coming from what we call systemic circulation coming back to your heart. So the right atrium is the first entry point of entry and then it goes flows into the right ventricle. Now the right ventricle, when it squeezes and contracts, what it's going to do is squeeze blood up into this different set of blood vessels. And these are what we call the pulmonary arteries. Now, in the, those previous pictures, these pulmonary arteries are color-coded blue. So they are, they're not veins, they're arteries. So what they are, even though they're color-coded blue, they are not veins. So whenever you see that kind of figure where it has a heart or its blood vessels or any blood vessels, like any part of the circulatory system, color coded red and blue, this is pretty standard across most medical texts. Maybe there are some rare exceptions, but blue does not mean vein. Blue actually refers to the content, so it's referring to deoxygenated blood in most common anatomical figures. Maybe there are rare exceptions, but whenever you see red and blue in the cardiovascular system, they're talking about blue being deoxygenated blood, so it's not vein. There's another misconception, so unless you're a horseshoe crab, deoxygenated blood is not blood, blue in real life. Yeah, sorry for the verb noises. So deoxygenated blood is not blue in real life. It does have a slightly different color. So blood you could get from your veins is darker, but it's not blue. So it's not like that bright, vivid blue we see in those figures. So blue in these figures is just for color coding and t telling you what the contents are. Now, deoxygenated blood. And um, notice that, okay, this pulmonary artery is, well, actually it goes through this thing called the pulmonary trunk, and then it goes, splits off into a left and right pulmonary artery. Again, these aren't switched around because this, again, is your patient's left side, and that's what we over here, have over here. Yeah, he's up there somewhere. So blue deoxygenated blood, so we have our pulmonary arteries, and where do they go to? And notice that's splitting off to the left and right. And what's to the left and right of your heart? If you don't know the answer already, well, what do you see to the left and right of your heart over here? It's not coincidental that your left and right lungs are right to the side and lateral to your heart. So that's why it's really cool like that we have these pulmonary trunks splitting off to the left and right, because that's where exactly it goes. The deoxygenated blood goes to the left and right, to the lungs, and again, your lungs are exchanging air, you're breathing in and out, so you're always breathe, bringing in new oxygen, breathing out carbon dioxide, so this is where you can reoxygenate your blood. Now we have the pulmonary veins. So the pulmonary veins, notice that the veins are coming back to the heart. So this is a very important part with arteries and veins. Arteries carry blood away. So think of it this way, arteries are away from the heart, Veins, so when someone's vein is all about themselves, right? So they are, they're very self-centered. They think it's all about them. So think about this way. Arteries is away from the heart. Vein is toward the heart. So veins and arteries are not necessarily about the contents. It's about the direction relative to the heart. So again, arteries carrying blood away. Veins carrying blood towards. Because again, someone whose vein is very self-centered. And <laughs> just like someone else too. <laughs> like it. He was saying, yeah, pay attention to me. Okay, so red oxygenated blood right here. So now because it's being oxygenated, this is why they color code it red. So when you have a red blood vessel in these diagrams, it implies that 
the contents have be, have been oxygenated. So that's why it switches from blue to red. And now it's going to collect this freshly oxygenated blood in the left atrium. Now from the left atrium, it's going to flow into the left ventricle. So it's always like that. So it's always going to, in a normal heart, you'll have blood flow going from atrium to ventricle. Yeah. And what we have here is like from the left ventricle, where does it go? So the left ventricle, when it squeezes, it's going to squeeze freshly oxygenated blood up into the aorta. That's the big blood vessel that leads from the left ventricle. And the aorta splits off to these other branches we'll talk about when we get to the blood vessel chapter. But basically, it's going to carry this freshly oxygenated blood to the upper body and lower body and pretty much the rest of the body. So this is what the left ventricle has a very important duty because why? It's the part that's delivering this oxygen and the blood along with it to the body. Now what we have here is another diagram from the Martini version showing you the blood flow. So again we have deoxygenated blood highlighted here in blue, collecting in the right atrium, flowing to the right ventricle, up through the pulmonary trunk, up to the left and right pulmonary arteries, going to the lungs, returning oxygenated to through these pulmonary veins. These pulmonary veins collect in the left atrium, and then the left atrium flows into the left ventricle. Then from the left ventricle, when it contracts, it squeezes into the aorta that helps to, and branches off into several other branches that deliver oxygenated blood to the rest of the body. So that's what we have here. And then when this blood is delivered to the rest of the body and eventually flows back, so this is why we call it closed circulation, because all the blood that's pumped out from the heart eventually has to return to it somehow. So when it returns, now it's being depleted of oxygen, now it can return back to the right atrium. Wash, rinse, repeat, the cycle starts all over again. So what drives this movement of blood? So how, does it just happen by itself? What does the circulation? Well, if you look at the cross section of the heart wall, what we have here is that there are different layers. So you just take just one section of the heart, like what we have here is the inside of the heart, and then let's look at the outside. So going from the inside to the outside, we have several different layers to the heart. So if we're going, then this is where those terms superficial and deep come in handy. So superficial, again, meaning more toward the surface of something, deep meaning going toward the inside of some structure. So what we have here is like this outer layer right here is what we call the pericardium. So it's surrounding the heart, therefore it's a pericardium. So like peri is often referring to some sort of, it's a prefix often used to say that something is surrounding something. Now then there's a little space here and it's called the pericardial cavity. Now does that mean it's full of air? Not in a normal heart. So pericardial cavity just means that it's a, some sort of space, it's some sort of area. So, but it's exaggerated in this case right here, just to for to illustrate that there is a separation between the pericardium and the epicardium, and you'll find out later that I'll cover in a future lecture that th these two are actually continuous. But that's uh, getting ahead of myself. So, right inner to the pericardium is another layer called the epicardium. And the epicardium is right here fused to what we call the myocardium. Now if you remember your prefixes and root words, myo means muscle. So this is the layer that has the majority of what we call cardiac muscle. It's similar to the other types of muscles, but it has its own specialties and differences that make cardiac muscle different from what we, well, when you think muscle, most, or say muscle to somebody, you think of skeletal muscles, the muscles you flex. There's also smooth muscle as well, but cardiac muscle is its own special type of muscle. And then you have the endocardium. And hey, if you like those prefixes and root words, epi means outer, endo means inner. So the epicardium compared to the endocardium is more outer. The endocardium is the innermost, deepest layer of the heart wall. And the myocardium is also in the middle. So that's another mnemonic you can use, myocardium in the middle. Okay, so what we have here is like a slide. So you can see that the epicardium has like the myocardium. Look at the different histology here. And now, do I want you to know exactly what's in this part? Well, I want you to more appreciate that the myocardium is where the majority of the heart muscle is. That's why if you look at just how the stru overall structure appears compared to the epicardium and endocardium. So the, end the epicardium and endocardium, they're more like 
more like lining. So the epicardium is more like an outer lining and the endocardium is more like an inner lining, but some myocardium, the muscle that does the hard work. So again, muscle contracts and this is what drives the heart's movement and this is what circulates blood in your body. Yeah, so that's what we have with the histology. Now, cardiac muscle, one thing that makes it special and unique compared to the other types of muscles is that they have something called intercalated discs. And it's kind of hard to see in this image, but compared to like a skeletal muscle fiber and like what we commonly call the muscles that we're working in the gym or trying to build up, this is what we have is intercalated discs. These are actually joining adjacent mu cardiac muscle cells. So it's not like a fused skeletal muscle fiber. So what we have here are all of these individual cardiac muscle cells and they're joined via these things called intercalated discs. And in these intercalated discs, they have these junctions that help to hold these cardiac muscle cells together. But they also have something called gap junctions. And gap junctions are important because if you go back all the way to the histology chapter and when we talk about different types of things that join cells, you have things that provide mechanical anchoring to, of cells to each other but gap junctions are kind of like little pores and little channels that actually connect the cytoplasm of cells that are right next to each other. So things like water, ions, and small molecules can actually flow between these two cells. And this is very important for carrying ions and what we call action potentials, um, throw back up to fill one for one, between cardiac muscle cells. Now again, but this is one commonality that cardiac muscle has with the other types of muscles. They, they, are, they are muscle cells and they have sarcomeres. That's why they appear striated and they, they have the kind of like zebra stripe, that stripe pattern. Those striations are because they still have very similar arrangements of the, what, those myofibrils. So what happens is that we have these thick and thin filaments and remember that the thick filaments are made out of myosin or one of the major components is myosin, and they pull actin filaments. So when these pull the actin filaments, that causes contraction. Or if you like my little figure from last semester, again, thick filaments are more than myosin, but myosin is the one that does the contraction. So what myosin does, it kind of like the myosin hence pull actin, and when it pulls actin, that causes these things called Z-lines and these sarcomeres to shorten. So when you have the shortening, what happens is that the overall length of these cells starts to decrease and this causes things to contract and shorten in length. So that's what we call sarcomeric shortening. Happens in both skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle. Now, why does that matter? Well, look at the ventricles and notice that they are very thick and they do have the epicardium and that thin endocardium. But the myocardium, that's the thickest layer and the myocardium has the muscle. So when you contract the muscle, what happens to it? It gets shorter and thicker and swells a bit. But this is what happens when you contract the cardiac muscle. When you contract, and we're looking like a cross section. So if you take a heart like this, then cut it like that. This is what we're looking at over here. So kind of this cross section. Now, when it contracts, just like when you have a circular muscle, and and actually this is useful preview for next upcoming units, is that when you have a ring of muscle, what happens when you contract it? Again, when you contract the muscle, it shortens. So when you contract the mu circular muscle, it starts to shorten and it decreases in diameter. So if we're looking at this cross section and looking at the diameter of the ventricles, we're noticing that when it contracts, it decreases in diameter. So why is that important and how does that relate to blood flow? Well, I like to draw an analogy between this and a squeeze bottle. So what happened? How do you get ketchup out of a squeeze bottle? You squeeze it, right? But what happens when you squeeze it is that you're contracting it, you're constricting it. So by constricting it, what are you doing? You're decreasing the volume. And when you decrease the volume and you have all this stuff contents in here, you're actually increasing the pressure of everything on the inside of that volume. So if you decrease the volume of a structure, that increases its internal pressure. And if you've taken, or anyone who's taken my classes and did before, they know that my favorite thing to say with physiology is things flow from high to low. Same with pressures. So if you go have a high pressure on one end and a low pressure on another end, pressure moves from high pressures to low pressures. Like, or if you've seen like those, um, was it those? Those movies where like there's an airplane and then all of a sudden something hits the 
causes a hole in the airplane and everything rushes out of the airplane because why? Well, at that high altitude, there's low pressure on the outside. You have pressurized cabin and everything just goes boom outside out of that hole toward the low pressure external environment. Same with pressure. So things flow from high to low pressures. So this is why we're able to squirt things out of that squeeze bottle, right? So we increase decrease the volume by constricting and contracting it, causing the pressure inside to build up, and this causes things to flow from high to low pressure. So this is a major mechanism of how the heart is able to pump blood. And actually this is an important concept because a similar but in concept occurs in the lungs, except with instead of blood, it's, we're talking about air in that context. But we'll save that for that one. Now back to cardiac muscles. So there's something, now this part, I don't expect you to know, and I label this as controversial, yeah, so it's kind of like diffusion, yep. But it's a different concept, but yeah, it's like, but it's something that occurs, a current recurring thing you see in physiology. Now what this doctor do, is doing, Dr. Torrent Wasp, I wonder if he's still alive. Now. We tried this multiple times with like cow hearts and we weren't able to do this. But what he's doing is like he his theory is that the heart is actually one muscle and you can unfold it. So it's like a just one continuous band of muscle. But do I expect you to know this theory? Not really because again some cardiologists are skeptical of this. But what this figure is showing is that all of the heart muscle is interconnected somehow. So the heart, the cardiologist will accept, yes, the heart, all the heart muscle cells are connected somehow. Whether it can be unfolded into that, that's a controversial part. But my main point is that compared to skeletal muscle, there's a big difference with cardiac muscle. So cardiac muscle, what we have here is that skeletal muscle, you have those individual fibers. And what's the difference between a very weak and soft movement versus doing a, like a very powerful movement with your skeletal muscles? It depends on recruitment of what we call those motor units. So if you have only a few skeletal muscle fibers contracting, you're going to have a pretty weak, not too much force and tension. But if you recruit more of these skeletal muscle fibers, you're going to get more powerful contraction. And if you have like, if you recruit all these skeletal muscles, you're going to have the maximum power and tension and force you can generate. Now with cardiac muscle, what we have here is that cardiac muscle is able to, the thing is that your heart has to maintain constant rhythm and beat. So it's very important that all the skeletal, or not skeletal, stop distracting me, Mr. Peanut. All the cardiac muscle cells have to coordinate with each other. So they are linked together, so they don't, can't operate in isolation like how we have with skeletal muscle fibers. If one cardiac muscle cell beats, it has to coordinate with the rest and affect its neighbors. So that's one big difference. Like you can have some cells contracting and some not in skeletal muscles, but eventually with every heartbeat, eventually all the cardiac muscle cells have to be at one point. So again, and this is a big difference between how they, they contract. Now let's look at this, I think it might be a cadaver heart in this figure from Martini. But what we have here is the left ventricle and here we have the right ventricle. Now look at the relative thickness between the left and right ventricle, which is thicker. So which of these ventricles has more muscle, left or right? And I'm not trying to trick you with this, but I'm trying to make a point. In the meantime, I'm going to try to calm down a little dinosaur. Let's see, do cardiac muscles contract, communicate with each other through hormones? So, or is it through electrical potentials? It's the latter. So electrical potentials are the major way that cardiac muscle cells can coordinate with each other. So that's why those gap junctions are really important. But back to our, our question at hand. So what is the correct answer to this? So hopefully, I think we almost got consensus. And yeah, nobody thankfully said right. But yes, the left has more muscle. And that's not coincidental because it depends on the task they have in front of them and their overall function. Now let's go back to our PowerPoint presentation. All right, so if you notice that the left ventricle is a lot thicker and therefore has more muscle. So what we have here is yeah, the right ventricle is like, it's there, but it doesn't need as much muscle. And it depends, again, this is where we have to talk about blood flow and rehash it again. So again, what we have is the left ventricle wall, whether it's relaxed or contracted. 
we notice that the right ventricle wall is thinner in diameter or th thinner in thickness compared to the left ventricle wall. Now, what we have to here is like even when it's contracted, they, both of them get a little thicker because they decrease in diameter. But again, you still have to have that cell volume, right? So both, the left ventricle wall is going to be thicker. That's the message of this slide right here. Now, why does it need to be thicker? Well, think about where the different ventricles pump to. So again, the right ventricle is going to pump blood into the pulmonary trunk, and that's going to carry, split off into the left and right pulmonary arteries that carry blood to the lungs. So that's what we have with the right ventricle. And the, the, the goal of the right ventricle is eventually get the blood to your lungs. And does it have much the distance to travel? Not really, because the lungs are right next to your heart. Now, with the left ventricle, what the left ventricle has to do is pump blood and that freshly oxygenated blood to the rest of the body. So it's not just the lungs it has to pump to, it has to pump to everything else, including your head, all the way down to the tips of your toes. So this is why the left ventricle is bulkier, because it has to pump blood, but now it has to carry it wider and further than it, the left or the right ventricle has to do. So again, the left ventricle is beefier because it has to throw that blood and pump it to uh, further than the right ventricle has to. <laughs> Annoying roommate. <laughs> I can't get annoyed at him, but yeah, he was being pretty cool away today. All right, so why does it matter? Well, here we have someone who's somewhat muscular, and then here he is muscular, but then we have someone even beefier. So this is what the muscle heart cardiac muscle is. The cardiac the heart is a big muscle, and then why does it need that muscle? That muscle is what's able to pump blood. Now, this is what we have with these two muscular dudes here, is that they're trying to carry blood through these vessels. So it's kind of like they're carrying this liquid, they're trying to carry it through this, ha this hallway over here. Now, what we have here with these hallways is that these are representing these vessels. Now, with the pulmonary arteries going to the lungs, what we have is that, okay, it's a shorter distance because, again, the lungs are right next to the heart, but with the pulmonary with, or, and with the, um, with the aorta, what we have is that the aorta has to branch off and carry out all this oxygenated blood to the rest of the body. So this is why they're not have different muscularities. Like this guy over here, he has a short distance to travel, so there's not much resistance, not much blood he has to get past. So this is why he's able to get away with being less bulky, because he has to travel a short distance. But this guy over here, he needs to be bulkier. Why? Because he's encountering a lot of resistance, and the physiological term for this is afterload. But we'll get to that like in future lectures. So because he has to carry things further and wider, and push against a lot of blood that's already there, and also other forces that are impeding him along the way through this vessel, this is why he needs to be beefier, because why there's more first, he has to travel further, and the thing is that he also has to pump blood at the same rate as this guy who has a shorter distance. So this is why our left ventricles are beefier, because again, they have harder work to do. That's why they got bulk up relative to our right ventricles. So that's why we the ventricular thickness matters, and these ventricles, even though they're both ventricles, they have different jobs. That's why they have different thicknesses. So yeah, life so right, 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 right and left ventricles, they have different jobs and different thicknesses. So, and then we have something called the interventricular septum. So this is how we're able to separate our left and right. So we do have this little part, we do have separation between our atrium and ventricles, but we also have separation between the left and right pairs of atria and ventricles uh, respectively. And there is an interatrial septum that's not visible in this image on OpenStax because it's obscured by the pulmonary trunk over here and the aorta, but it's there, just take my word for it. Now what we have here are, so why does this matter? Well septal defects are what can happen if you have a hole or an incomplete closure between the left and right ventricles. So what we notice with the left and right ventricles is that the left vent or no, the left and right chambers of the heart, the left chambers contain oxygenated blood, but the right part chambers of the heart contain deoxygenated blood. So if there's a hole somewhere in either of these septa, these are going to allow this deoxygenated blood and, re and oxygenated blood to mix. Now, which happens? Does the deoxygenated go to the oxygenated or does oxygenated go to the deoxygenated? Well, 
what happens if you have this little hole? It depends. Well, this is where I have to talk about these chambers and their thickness again. So a ventricular septal de defect is when you have this hole in the septum dividing the left and right ventricles over here. So that's what we have over here. Now the oxygenated blood is going to move across into the right ventricle. And why is that? Again, which is beefier, the left or right ventricle? So if we have both of these ventricles, and this is another thing when we talk about the cardiac cycle, is that the ventricles are split in a normal heart contract at the same time. So they're basically contracting and flexing at the same time. But who's going to win the flex off? Yeah, the one with more muscle, right? So this is why when you have a ventricular septal defect, the one the chamber with more muscle is going to win out. So this is why when you have a ventricular septal defect, you have the oxygenated blood going to the right chamber, and then you have more volume going into the right chamber. Now you might be thinking, wait, isn't this, isn't this a good thing? We have more oxygen going to oxygenation of this blood. Well, that's the other thing. Like all the blood carried by the left ventricle, I shouldn't say all of the blood, but the left ventricle, by pushing some of this blood into the right ventricle, it's actually pushing some of its workload and that fluid into the right ventricle. So now the right ventricle, instead of having its normal workload, it's like the left ventricle is like, here, do some of my work and I'm going to give you more. Well, the right ventricle is used to only having a certain amount, have to pump a certain amount of blood. So the, now the right ventricle is dealing with more blood than it's usually supposed to happen. And if it's unable to generate enough force, what can happen is that this extra blood and fluid can accumulate in the lungs. And this is why it's important to fix this. And uh, because of this, yeah, you want this balance and you don't want that. So how can you do that? Flex hard like flex tape. Speaking of flex tape, this is how you fix it. So this is why it's important to detect these because you don't want the right ventricle and the lungs to have increased fluid in the lungs. So this is why it's important to patch this and prevent separate that so that we have the left and right ventricles pumping the right amount of blood and that the left ventricle isn't shunting some of its extra workload to the right ventricle. Now, atrial septal defects, these are interesting as well. So you can't have a hole in there, but the ventricles are the ones that do the heavy lifting. So if you like the atria, they're pretty flimsy too. Like they're important, but they don't contract and generate the force that we need to pump the, or pump blood to the lungs or pump to systemic circulation respectively. It's less common and sometimes it goes undetected. So we do get some sort of recycling, but this amount of blood returning isn't like we're having it come back from this huge, big old left ventricle pushing its work onto the right ventricle. So sometimes like people can live relatively normal lives not knowing that they have an atrial septal defect. But the left ventricle that and the ventricular septal defect, that's the problematic one. Yeah. And shunt actually has a different, yeah, so shunt refers to like kind of moving something from a pl different place and bypassing something. We might not be able to get to that in terms of physiology for this semester, but when we talk about respiratory, we might be able to talk about it if we have time. All right, so what we have is like, again, this is what you definitely should take from this lecture is that we have this the flow from the body. So deoxygenated blood, again, we're talking about circulatory, circulatory anatomy. That blue is not vein. So again, most of the blue vessels are veins, but it refers to the contents. So right ventricle goes to the pulmonary arteries and the pulmonary arteries go to the lungs that oxygenate the blood. Now, what prevents it from backing up? So notice that we have this flow that goes in this direction, but what prevents things from going the other way around? Well, similar things that prevents your bathroom from ending up like this. There's something called valves. And valves are very important because they maintain direction in your circulatory system. Now, heart valves, they look like this. And I wish I should try to get better pictures. But well, these are the valves, and they look like little flaps. Of, and what they are are very tough and flexible. So they're very thin. They're tough, but they're also flexible parts of extracellular matrix that help to maintain flow. So if you look at these valves, they're, well, they're kind of like one-way doors. 
like you can push a door, but the thing is that the blood is due to the pressure, so you go from high to low pressure, right? So blood is good at pushing, but it's not really good at pulling things. So when you have things pushing through a one-way door, it's going to be pushing to from high to low pressure and in the direction the door opens. So what these heart valves do they, is that they really should and normally open in only one direction unless something wrong or something damages them or there's some sort of defect in them. So they maintain the direction of flow. They're like the one-way doors. So they prevent blood from going backwards just like how your sewage system, you don't want whatever you flush down the toilet backing up back into your toilet or whatever if you put down your sink going back into your sink. So this is why you're just like your the plumbing inside wherever you live. You have heart valves that keep your plumbing inside of your circulatory system flowing correctly. And they have to be thin, flexible, and strong because again, if they were very rigid, like think about like a very light door versus a very heavy metal bank vault door. Like yeah, the heavy door is going to be stronger but it's also harder to move quicker. So the thing is about your heart is that it's always constantly beating. So you want something that's strong, but you want something that's flexible because why? Well, say you need to increase your heart rate and you don't want something that's very stiff and things that are very stiff are also prone to breaking as well. So this is why your heart valves are made of that very, very strong extracellular matrix. So yeah, this is what prevents the black backflow. So what we have here are these little valves. And the valves help to maintain flow from atria to ventricles and prevent backing up of blood flow going from these major vessels back into the ventricles as well. Because if you didn't have that, this is what we would call regurgitation. Now, when you might have heard the term regurgitation referring to like if like Mr. Peanuts mom and dad when he was a little chicklet they regurgitated their little food or if you know like if you know what pigeon milk is you have the curse of knowledge of what that is and why you might want to say no to pigeon milk regurgitation means some sort of backwards flow because again when we eat something it goes from our mouth and then goes through our GI tract but if we're going from our GI tract and out back through our mouth that's the atypical flow so that's why we call it regurgitation now with the cardiovascular system, when you have regurgitation, that's what we talk about, backward flow of blood across, <laughs> going in the opposite direction that normally flows. And this is often due to some sort of defect or some sort of problem in the valves over here. So this is why valves are very important because they prevent regurgitation in our circulatory system. So what we have here is that, okay, we're looking at the left ventricle. So what's happening is that the left ventricle is relaxed. So what we have here is that the left ventricle, when it relaxes, so remember that when the muscle contracts, it increases the pressure. The opposite is also true. So instead of contracting, when something relaxes, the volume increases. And when the volume increases, so it's kind of like going from a very tight piece of clothing to a very loose piece of clothing. The pressure drops. So with lower pressure, this is why the left ventricles are able to fill because due to relaxing and having more volume, there's lower pressure and this kind of like sucks the blood in from the left atrium. The left atria do, does, does squeeze a bit to help pull up this process along, but this relaxation is very important. Now, when the left ventricle contracts, what happens is that it squeezes and now it's going to push this blood up like that squeeze bottle into the aorta. But this valve what here, over here, what we call the mitral or bicuspid valve, this is what we call an atrioventricular valve because it's a valve between the atrium and a ventricle. Now, the thing is that this valve is only supposed to go from atrium to ventricle. The cool thing is that not only does it have this kind of shape, it also has these little attachments over here, including to, and this is what we call chordae tendine, and also a little anchor of muscle here we call the papillary muscle. So what it does is that this little muscle also contracts, so it's kind of like holding onto something like a parachute strings, and this is what happens when this, con this whole ventricle contracts. So this valve, if it didn't have these little strings, what would happen is if you had that pressure, it would just invert and regurgitate. But by having those chordae tendine and having that little papillary muscle kind of hold on to those chordae tendine, that keeps the valve flowing like this, or the valve held shut like this. So when even though you have the pressure, because it's still pointing toward the ventricles, that prevents it from blowing out the wrong way. 
and keeps the valve holding its shape and preventing the back flushing and regurgitation of blood into the atrium. Our exam scores out 55. They're out of they're out of um, 200 to, or 2,200. So yeah, that's like 55 times 40. So they are out of 55. 58 is just because remember there are those bonus questions. So again, the bonus questions don't count against you. So it is out of 55 raw score. So yeah, this is why we have the coronary tendine and the papillary muscles because they help to maintain the shape and keep the valves pointing in the right direction even if they're under extreme pressure over here. So the AV valves are between the atria and the ventricles. So we have the tricuspid valve and we have the bicuspid valve or sometimes also known as the mitral valve. You should know both and I would use them interchangeably. So the mitral valve is the bicuspid valve. So you should definitely keep that in mind. Now this is another mnemonic, try before you buy. So this is if you're looking at this view of the, the, the heart, the tricuspid valve is on the right, the mitral valve is on the left. So tri mitral aka bicuspid. Now there's another val set of valves. So we have the, from the right ventricle leading up to the pulmonary trunk, we have the pulmonary valve, very convenient. Now what we have with the left ventricle going up to the aorta, we have the aortic valve. So not visible in this picture, but take my word for it, it's between the left ventricle and going up to the aorta. And these are what we call semi-lunar valves. So semi-lunar saying that they look like a half moon. So if you take just one of these little leaflets of a valve by itself. So these are our heart valves. So again, heart valves from the body, we have go to the right atrium, from the right atrium to the right ventricle. We have the tricuspid valve. So again, the AV valves, the tricuspid is one of them. That's between the right atrium and ventricle. From the right ventricle going to the pulmonary trunk and the pulmonary arteries, we have the pulmonary valve. So that goes to the lungs and to the from the lungs, the oxygenated blood collects into the left atrium. The left atrium to the ventricle, another AV valve, that's our bicuspid slash mitral valve. And then from the left ventricle up into the aorta, we have our aortic valve. So these are the four main heart valves. You should know them by heart. One pun not intended, but yes, it's very important to know that they're there because again, if you don't have them, they're going to cause regurgitation and you're going to have back flushing of blood where you just originally pumped them from. Another little favorite mnemonic of mine is this. So what we have, tricuspid pulmonary aort, mitral and aortic. So I want you to know the order of what, what con chambers they connect and also the order of blood flow. So what's the correct order of blood flow through them? Say you start in the right atrium. What would be the right order of traveling through these valves if you're, like, you're a red blood cell or molecule, molecule of hemoglobin traveling through your circulatory system? So my favorite mnemonic is this. So say you're out, say, like go, going somewhere and you encounter a big like burly moak guy and he's like he's like trying to say what you like beef and he's like trying to start something with you and you're like oh no no it's like i don't want to try this it's like and he thinks you're getting super aggro on him but you also don't know that this moak is actually another a professor of anatomy and it's like what you like beef you like scrap what you like try pull my aorta so that's my mnemonic. So try pull my aorta. It tells you your these valves. If you start from the right atrium, it tells you the order that you would travel through them through each of these four valves of your heart. And I think I'll leave it at that. And I have to calm down this little Mr. Peanut who is a little annoyed today. I think Friday I might have to keep him at home. <laughs> but yeah, so. We're still waiting for makeup exams to finish, and I'll have to also review exam footage as well. But yeah, so things are out of 220, even if you took it uh, at the Mono Testing Center. Like, La Lima is funky with extra credit, so I have to do a little workaround. That's why I have to pretty much copy and paste it to something out of 2200s as well, okay? And yes, so thank you all for attending. Thanks to our moderators, and thank you for... <laughs> <laughs> providing unintentional in <laughs> making this uh, lecture a little unintentionally interesting all right yeah so mr. Pina is yeah <laughs> translating but yeah all right so thank you everyone for your patience and yeah oh yeah now you want head scratches of course <laughs> <laughs>